Hello, and welcome back to Mind Over Chatter, the Cambridge University podcast. I'm James. I'm Nick. And I'm Naomi. And once again, we're inviting you to join us in our conversations with clever, curious people here in Cambridge. In this third series, we're talking about health. And in this episode, we're focusing on mental health. We're going to cover everything from the prevalence of mental health problems and eating disorders, social media and sedentary behaviour, and video games, including Hellblade. So who are we talking to in this episode? We talked to a professor of child and adolescent psychiatry. Hello, I'm Tamsin Ford. I'm professor of child and adolescent um, psychiatry at the Department of Psychiatry. A professor of health neuroscience. Hello, I'm Paul Fletcher. I'm a psychiatrist and I'm professor of health neuroscience at the University of Cambridge. And a behavioural epidemiologist. Hello, I'm Esther von Slaus and I'm a MRC programme leader at the MRC Epidemiology Unit. As usual, we began by asking our guests to tell us a little about their research. Yes, well, I um, and my group spend our time researching how we can optimise the organisation and delivery of services and also individual interventions to optimise the mental health of children and young people. I'm very interested in in perception and learning in the brain and how it might go wrong in mental illness. And I'm I'm very interested particularly in the the growing field of research that that sees the brain and the the mental processes that it carries out as, as being shaped not just by what goes on inside the skull, but as this complex interaction of body, brain and environment. So my group is particularly interested in trying to understand and change young people's diet and physical activity behaviour. And we predominantly focus our attention on educational settings and family settings. With all of our episodes, we always try and, you know, set the scene, so to speak, in each and give a sort of introduction to each of the episodes. So obviously with this topic, we're talking about mental health. Um, So I'll ask, I'll put this one to Paul to start with. Um, If you could sort of explain to us, what does it mean to have a sort of a mental disorder and how do we classify or who falls into that class of being mentally ill? Um, Yeah, I can see the relief on Tamsin's face there that she didn't get asked that. Um, So that is an incredibly difficult question. And you have to remember that uh, any answer I give is going to annoy and offend somebody. Um, You know, there are some people who would completely deny the existence of mental illness and would suggest that actually it's a medicalization of an experience that is perfectly understandable as a normal reaction to one's circumstances. I disagree with that. I think there are certain instances in which there are processes that go wrong and require medical intervention. And I think in psychiatry, we have this profoundly difficult problem that unlike some other branches of medicine, we don't have very clear markers for when somebody's ill. We don't have sort of blood readouts and imaging readouts and so forth. So the categorization actually boils down to very carefully documenting someone's experiences and their reactions to those experiences and then trying to ascertain whether they have particular symptoms. So are they are they hearing or seeing things that aren't there? Do they have beliefs that really aren't possible to comprehend in the context of their their life. So um, as as you can tell, I don't know the answer to your question. I don't think there's any simple answer. Um, And I'm I'm, I'm blathering a bit. But I I think categorization of mental illness is largely down to uh, skilled and detailed history taking and trying to ascertain whether somebody has a sort of constellation of symptoms and whether those come together in a recognized pattern that we can then say, OK, this person seems to fit into uh, such and such a category. And therefore, these are the appropriate uh, steps to take in their, in their management. I'm, I'm sure Tamsin could have given a much more succinct and useful response. So maybe she'd want to chip in there. I think you did an excellent job. I think we should apologise less. We don't have, as as, um, mental health practitioners, we don't have blood tests and scans and things. You're right. Yet, maybe they will come. But actually, I think there is as much confusion about at what point wheezing. So, you know, I end up coughing after every run I do. I could go to the GP and say, you know, I might end up with an inhaler and he might think I have um, exercise-induced asthma, but it doesn't get in the way of my life, so I haven't bothered to go. And I think there is as much fuzziness 
particularly in primary care, uh, for physical health conditions. I think the one of the problems that mental health has is we use language in a sloppy way. So we talk about mental health when we think about, we're actually thinking about mental illness, and that actually causes a lot of confusion and robs those who are having experiences that they're struggling to deal with, with a way of expressing themselves. And I think at the extremes, when someone's doing fine or someone is really distressed and unable to function, nobody would query that on one side somebody's doing really well and they're healthy, and on the other side um, somebody's really struggling. But there is a fuzzy dividing line, um, and I think that comes with the biological makeup of the person some of us temperamentally are much more reactive to things than others it comes with the psychological wherewithal of you know what's happened to that individual in the past and also their social supports and that's what makes the difference of being able to c cope with the curveballs that um, life throws at you or not. Tamsin you mentioned here the possible distinction between um mental illness, mental ill health, and I know we might also talk about mental disorders. Um, can you either piece those apart a little bit or just maybe give us a sense from each of your perspectives which of those we're talking about often? I think, for me, mental health is a spectrum from absolutely thriving and being, you know, really happy and everything's going well, which I hope we all experience some of the time but let's face it it's not real life you know there's usually you know some challenge somewhere for most of us and we're all going to experience disappointments and bereavements and you know stressful situations and then at the other extreme I think when something is getting in the way of um, your ability to cope with your activities of daily living so it, you know anxiety is a normal reaction, feeling sad is a normal reaction, psychotic illness isn't, it's very unusual experiences. But if you have things that are stopping you working, mucking up your relationships, interfering with your ability to eat, sleep, then I think you are shading into disorder. But that it's not a kind of sharp division. But I, I think you would find the same if you really examined it for many other conditions. You know, we talk about, um, you know, stages and grading of cancers, but actually, you know, again, it's not these sharp categories that fit neatly into boxes. It'll be a spectrum of progression from totally benign to aggressively malignant. Can I just ask, where do you see mental well-being? fitting in that term? I, I think it's a really interesting question. For me, I see health as a spectrum and I would say well-being fits with the thriving and doing really well. But like quality of life, um, you can have a long-term mental health condition but have fairly good well-being with it and the same thing you can have chronic physical ill health or a disability but score highly on well-being and quality of life measures so it, it's not as simple as just being the top end of being mentally healthy yeah and just to um follow up one of the points tamsin made about um you know psychiatry in in some ways being like other branches of medicine in that there's often a, a fantasy that a diagnosis in standard medical practice is a very clear-cut one with not no need to worry about psychological and social factors but of course that's completely untrue and you know there was a there was a very famous paper in the 1970s pleading with the profession as a whole to introduce the biopsychosocial model in recognition of the fact that no illness can really be con fully comprehended outside of the social situation in which it's occurring and the psychological uh, processes that go along with it and I think psychiatry has probably been one of the quickest branches to, to take take up that challenge uh, so in many ways um, you know the problems we're dealing with are, are are not unique to psychiatry and some of the criticisms of the diagnostic process I do think ignore or, or take a very simplistic stance that 
if you can't find a biological abnormality, then it's not an illness and therefore psychiatry is not a branch of medicine. That, that really, it's, it's a slight caricature, but it's a position that is held. Um, and I think anybody who knows anything about illness and health uh, would, would recognize the oversimplicity of that. And in fact, one of the things we can't do is diagnose health. Uh, you know, the, the definition is that it's a state of complete um, psychological, social and physical well-being, which, of course, very few of us could actually aspire to. I'm just going to jump in here. So I'm not going to ask for a diagnosis of health, but I'm going to ask about the scale of the problem. So we can think about this context in a physical sort of a, and a mental capacity. So eating disorders as well um, as mental health, health disorders. And do they differentiate? But if we're thinking about the scale of the problem, <clears throat> you can read quite often, I'll, I'll say they, some say that we're sort of living through a sort of mental health crisis. Now, I don't know if you agree with that, but can we sort of talk about the scale of the problem um, that we're finding in a wider context? I can certainly speak for young people. I'm, I get a bit rusty with grown-ups um, but um, I've been involved in large national surveys of the mental health of children and young people since the turn of the century and probably for about the last seven or eight years there's been increasing sort of concern about the mental health of children and young people in the media talking about a tsunami of referrals and, you know, our young people are in crisis. In fact, there were big surveys in 1999, 2004, and then 2017. And the 2017 survey did show an increase, but it was an increase from one in 10 to one in nine. It wasn't massive. What is much more concerning is um, the rates of problems or disorder, by which I mean young people who are really struggling with the things you kind of need to do to get on with everyday life in our older teenagers and particularly young women. And that's coming out of surveys of adults, um, 16 to 24, and the last survey in 2017 had 17 to 19 year olds. Now, because of the pandemic, we managed to get a little bit more money from the Department of Health, and we went back to see this sample in 2017. We went back in 2020 and 2021, and what we've shown is a deterioration from one in nine to one in six, which was maintained across both years. So at a population level, our young people are not doing as well as they were pre-pandemic, but of course there was quite a big gap in time between the 2017 survey and the, the pandemic starting. So we can't say it's definitely that, but there is something going on. However, within that, there will be subgroups who are more or less affected. So the only adult data I do know is from a panel survey where people come in at the age of 16, and then they, they go back every so often and the same people are filling in the same questionnaires. And that shows that they're quite, there's some very different direct, um, sort of trajectories. So there are some people who are doing consistently well or even very well, absolutely thriving all the way through the pandemic. Then there are others who have done consistently badly. And there's a group where there was an abrupt deterioration and then they're sort of settling down a bit, but they don't get back to their baseline level. And then there is a group whose mental health has just deteriorated. And what seems to be driving that, um, this is not an experiment, so we can't say it's causal, but it, it seems to be financial insecurity, housing insecurity, job insecurity, and coming from more marginalized groups. So women, ethnic minorities, um, you know, so it's the standard risk factors that we know are very bad for your physical and mental health, but they, you get these stacking of risk factors on um, certain parts of society. And Paul, I know you did a heroic um, review of the data for the Cambridge Neuroscience talk that we um, that you spoke. I don't know if you've got more to say on this. No, I mean, I think you, you've not just summed it up very beautifully, but you've um, updated what, what I was reading. I mean, I, I was slightly um, 
I, I, th I think the pandemic in some ways has thrown into relief some of the uncertainty in this middle ground that Tamsin talked about, which is that blurred area where we're not quite sure whether we want to call it illness or disorder or, or what. Um, and I think uh, one of the striking things about some of the work coming out of the pandemic was that a very anxious and depressing situation was making people anxious and depressed. And, and I think that there can be a tendency to, um, I mean, I know people were criticizing um, some of the research for medicalizing a very normal reaction. And, and I think that's, uh, that's, that's a fair criticism. Can, can I just ask, in terms of the, um, you were talking about the prevalence, Tamsin, so about how many people at one point have a, a particular disorder or are not mentally uh, well. Um, do you have an idea what part of that is due to new people developing mental illnesses and what part of that is due to the fact that actually because services have been reduced so much over the past few years, actually there are people who are experiencing mental illnesses for longer than they might have done in previous years? That's a really good question. Um, and I can't, I don't think we have the data to answer it. I think we should be gathering that kind of data. Um, I think we should hold on to the fact, so let's take um, children and young people into sort of emerging adulthood, you know, late teens, early 20s. So one in six is a scary number to not be doing very well, but that still means five out of six are doing okay those with existing this is sort of at a population level not a service level those with existing mental health conditions have done really badly they are another high risk group for having consistently poorer mental health throughout in these longitudinal surveys um, what we have seen is lots of new presentations of eating disorders um, particularly again in young people so not only are they increased, so doubled at the end of last year in children and young people, and I don't think it's that different in adults. It's certainly a very, very substantial increase. But actually the biggest increase has been in emergency and urgent presentations, not in routine presentations. So you've got a combination there um, of both new um, you know, new development of eating disorders, but also presenting later, whether that's because it was harder to get to services or people were worried about going to services because of um, the risk of catching COVID. Certainly um, for other referrals, which of course quite a lot come through schools. So when schools were shut, it's not surprising that there was a big drop in the number of referrals to child mental health services, but also I think there was a reluctance so in the 2020 national survey, half those who were concerned about either their child's mental health or, you know, the young people who were answering for themselves, about half of those who were concerned said that they didn't seek help as a deliberate decision. Now we're about to start some service use interviews with a sample of, of those young people and their parents to find out what that was about, because we kind of need to know um, because, you know, you pay a heavy developmental price as a young person if you are not functioning for three or four or six months. You know, that that's kind of could be a whole academic year at school that you then have to catch up on whilst you're also trying to protect your mental health. OK, let's pause a moment. We started this conversation with what turned out to be maybe one of the most difficult questions to answer. It's a pretty reasonable one though. What does it mean to have a mental illness? And it turns out there's no simple answer, particularly because we don't have any clear physical markers that indicate when someone is mentally ill. It's not as if we can run a blood test or perform a scan of some sort. Well, not yet at least. So as Tamsin and Paul said, working out whether someone is mentally unwell is therefore more like piecing together a jigsaw puzzle of various indicators. Paul described it as putting together a constellation of symptoms and then asking whether those symptoms come together in a recognisable pattern. Sort of like the Big Dipper of mental health, or the Little Dipper, or Ryan's Belt. The key point is that if and when something is getting in the way of you going about your daily routines, working, eating, 
sleeping. Watching the repair shop, playing mousetrap. Then it's more like you might have a mental health condition. Tamsin compared it to the stages and gradings of cancers. There aren't any sharp distinctions between different stages. Instead, it's a spectrum with lots of fuzziness in between. Okay, but where does mental well-being fit into the mix? Well... What we heard was that we should think of health as a spectrum. So many spectrums, like a flag shop during Pride Week. A spectrum of well-being at one end and illness at the other. Well-being corresponds to thriving and enjoying a good quality of life. That being said, you can have a long-term mental illness but still have pretty good well-being, just as you can have a chronic physical condition but still have a good quality of life. And what do we learn about the scale of the problem? How much mental ill health is out there? Well, one of the key things we heard was that on a national level, there is increasing concern about young people's mental health, those aged between 16 and 24. Yes, according to statistics from the UK's Department of Health, there's been a deterioration in the mental health of young people. In 2017, one in nine were suffering from an illness, which isn't great, but by 2020, that had increased to one in six, which really isn't great. Is there any chance this deterioration in mental health has been caused by the pandemic? Well, These studies can't prove that the pandemic has caused mental ill health. They're correlation studies only. If there's one thing I learned in stats class at school, it's that correlation does not equal causation. And if there's one thing I learned in stats class at school, it's that wearing a graphical calculator in a holster on your hip so that you can whip it out and calculate a confidence interval at a moment's notice is mega cool. Shout out to Mr. Hopley. So, no, we can't say for certain that this deterioration in the population's mental health is necessarily because of the pandemic. Another important thing to keep in mind is that we heard the risk factors for poor mental health, basically the various things which might make it more likely that you suffer from mental ill health, stack or pile up on one another, making mental ill health even more likely if you meet multiple risk factors. And those risk factors can include things like financial insecurity, housing insecurity, and job insecurity. Insecurity, basically, of any sort. And being part of a marginalised group, such as women and ethnic minorities. But did I hear that this data has its critics? Yes, that's right. Paul pointed out that the medicalization of a normal reaction to a stressful and anxious situation, in other words, treating the natural anxiety and depression, which might result from a global pandemic, lockdown and COVID as a mental ill health, has come in for some criticism. Okay, but even if we accept that the prevalence of mental health problems in the UK has increased, Why is that? Is it because more people are developing mental illnesses? Or is it because available services to help people have reduced in recent years, so we have less capacity to prevent people from becoming unwell? Or it could be that people are now experiencing mental ill health for longer than they would have because they're not getting treated, so that the numbers suffering mental ill health at any time are slowly getting bigger. Well, this is the million dollar question, isn't it? But unfortunately, we can't ask the audience or phone a friend. We can't even look deep into Chris Tarrant's eyes for the hint of a clue. No, basically, we don't have the data to answer the question. But we should get that data. Agreed. Although when we say we, I'm hoping that doesn't include me personally. I wouldn't know where to start. So even if one in six are suffering mental ill health, which is pretty awful, I guess that means at least five and six aren't? That's true. I guess the glass of mental well-being is at least five-sixths full. Yeah, I'm an optimist like that. But unfortunately, there's more to worry about hiding behind those numbers. For example, we also heard that there's been a big increase in eating disorders. Yeah, the prevalence of eating disorders has doubled between 2017 and 2020. And on top of that, we're also seeing a big increase in emergency presentations of mental illness, which means that people are only seeking help at a much later stage of their illness. This could be due to COVID. Maybe they don't want to risk heading into a hospital and possibly catching something. Or maybe they are reluctant to seek help and feel like they're putting a burden on the healthcare system at such a difficult time. It might also be that people are aware of how many others are struggling and feel as if they need to stay strong and therefore avoid seeking help until things have already become really bad. And thinking about young people in particular, Tamsin stressed 
how disruptive mental ill health can be if things got to the point where school is being missed, which might really affect a young person's development. Um, Esther, maybe you could say a bit more from your perspective about what else is going on with children, adolescents and young people, maybe especially during the pandemic that surrounds their mental health. So they've, they've presumably there's also their physical health, there's their diet, there's what they're doing from a day to day perspective. You know, can you say anything about that? Um, yeah, so so my research particularly concerns um, physical activity behaviour, sedentary behaviour, and and um, to a, a smaller extent dietary behaviour. So we know from previous surveys, pre-pandemic, that adolescents between the age of um, eleven and eighteen, actually eighty percent of them are not sufficiently active. And what we mean by that is they don't meet the World Health Organization guidelines of engaging in 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity per day. And that's a staggering number, which surprisingly hasn't changed much in the sort of past 20 years. Um, we also know that children spend a lot of their time being sedentary. And over the past 20 years, that has changed from spending time in reading and maybe playing musical instruments to more screen based activities. Uh, and particularly, obviously, in current days, it's around um, sort of playing video games and social media. Um we know from a mental health perspective that there are uh, associations, particularly bet between sedentary behaviour or the amount spent amount of time spent using screens and um, mental health outcomes later in life. So maybe even within adolescence, if we look um, at three or four years later, but even we're able to predict mental health in um, sort of middle uh, adulthood. Um, but very interesting, quite recent research is showing that it's actually the um, sedentary behaviours and also the screen based behaviours that are mentally passive. So where you're just absorbing information, you're not actually actively engaging with it, that tend to be most detrimental to um, children and adults, mental well-being and mental health. Um, and so, but, and it's, uh, those are activities like TV viewing, but also listening to the radio, for example, they're not necessarily the screen, non-screen divide, because actually, Playing video games is actually quite mentally active um, and that doesn't seem to show that strong association with mental well-being. Obviously, there is a, a group of children that have problematic um, uh, gaming uh, and, and we're not talking about that population. Could, could I ask, yes, I mean, I think that's really interesting um, and fascinating to hear. D does that sort of behaviour interact with, say, uh, consumption and things like that. I mean, are they more likely to be eating when they're reading or, or, or listening to the radio? D does it sort of, is there a sort of, I suppose synergistic is, is the wrong word, but is there a sort of interactive effect? I think that's a really good question. And we don't tend to have the quality data to um, assess that because it's we don't have simultaneous data of actually what children are doing when they're sedentary and what they are consuming at that time. What we might have is data from monitors such as pedometers or accelerometers that allow us to assess, okay, these children are not being active at the time and we then might have a simultaneous diet diary and we know what they're eating. But actually the interesting element is around what they're they are actually doing when they're being sedentary. And so, but I do think that actually when you're being mentally active, you are probably have some sort of physical activity as well. Not very active, but when you're gaming, it's quite difficult to be eating because actually you're using your yeah. hands constantly. Similarly, when you're playing a musical instrument, when you're watching television, actually it's much easier to consume. So I think it's a really interesting question and that it, it could be related to both physical and mental health outcomes. And you, you talked a little bit about um, the last 20 years and the way in which some of those numbers you told us about have been pretty constant over that period. Has there been any noticeable change during the pandemic and during the last 18 months or so? 
Um, so the data on that is pretty weak. Um, obviously, uh, for many children, schools are a very important source of their physical activity. So, for example, here in the UK, they, they would do their PE there, but there's also after school sports and, and other sports activities around school. There might be active travel to school. Um, so we have seen a drop in physical activity during the lockdowns when schools were closed. For many children, they were able to pick up again on their activity levels um, when schools returned. But it's very important to recognise that actually schools didn't return to normal, and particularly in terms of the activities they were offering. So PE was very restricted. Many schools were not offering after-school activities. Um, and I think that have le that has left many children in, um, so the children have gained more weight over that period. We do have quite a good evidence on that. They will have lost some of their physical fitness. And we know that these are key barriers for children to become more active again. So actually, I think some of the longer term data will demonstrate a, a steeper decline in physical activity levels than they have been doing for the sort of up until the pandemic. And can I ask Esther, this, this idea that there's been a reduction in uh, meeting the, the sort of target of 60 minutes of vigorous exercise a day, has that has there been any other factors that might have driven that, such as has there been a reduction in, in the provision that schools make for physical activity or after school clubs or things like that? Do you mean in general or during the pandemic? Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering in general, because there's a sort of, it may be completely wrong, but there's a fantasy that schools don't go in for the same levels of sports coaching and teaching that they used to. And I, I don't know whether that's true or not, but I'd be curious to know. Um. So... Uh, Physical activity, I talk about physical activity in its general sense. So it's not exercise or sport or PE, it's any sort of activity. So it includes um, play in the playground, um, going for a walk with your family, walking the dog, those active travel, those sorts of things. Um, actually, there's some evidence that the provision of schools actually hasn't changed that much over the sort of past few decades. There is definitely a sense that due to a refocus of, uh, particularly from the government perspective, on certain core subjects, and for example, Ofsted rankings linked to that and things like that, that um, it has uh, um, it has dropped. Um, a bit in terms of its standing. So we all know the examples of when it comes towards th this time, for example, children start practicing their Christmas plays and the first thing they, that gets dropped for that is the PE lesson. Um, so it, it, it does have a lower standing than many other subjects. But when we look at the data, so we know, for example, that physical activity de declines very steeply from childhood into adolescence and then into adulthood. When we look at that data more specifically and look at when physical activity changes in terms of the times of the week, we see that most of that change happens outside of school. So it's before school, it's after school and it's at the weekends. So actually it looks like schools are able to continue to provide a good provision for children, but it's actually those out of school periods that is where the drop is most steeply and where we should maybe focus more of our attention. Any ideas where, where that originates from? Um, yes, well, it's, it's, I think it's just partly down to uh, the increase in sort of uh, homework and things that children have to do. It's partly due to the attraction of uh, uh, like screens and computer games, but it's also partly due to over time, social norms have changed about what is acceptable for children to do. So this this idea, this bubble wrap that we tend to talk about, that we cover our children with, that it's dangerous to go outside and play with your um, with uh, your friends um, without actually parental supervision, go to the playground by yourselves. We're making playgrounds actually less attractive by children by making them safer. All of these aspects play, come into play when we think about physical activity outside of the school environment. And very quickly, if I could just ask a final follow-up question to Tamsin. We've been talking about 
physical activity, to what extent is that a sort of intervention which you'd recognise to improve mental health and well-being? Well, I think, again, that is a very good point. I mean, you know, if you are someone who is naturally sporty, actually, you know, friends of mine I know who are runners, if they are injured and can't run, they're like a bear with a sore toe. You know, they're just... The frustration is palpable, and for them... You know, and for me, doing yoga is something that I use that I know boosts my mental well-being and I really miss it when it's not there. However, it has to be something you enjoy. You can't take somebody who is really not very sporty and force them. You know, I'm sure if people look, there would be a type of activity being it dancing or going for a walk. You know, it doesn't have to be elite sport. Um there is a there is an evidence based treatment for um, depression called behavioural activation. Now it's not only about um, doing exercise or doing physical activity, but it is about scheduling and structuring your day and making sure that you do something. And of course, if you are doing some kind of um, activity or class there is a structure around that there's a time you go you interact with people you do the activity you get a sense of mastery and all of that plays in and in fact there's a trial being um, led by a colleague of mine from Manchester of the same um, kind of intervention in um, in adolescents who that you know the peak onset of depression as a mental health condition you know the kind of you know, getting in the way of studying your friendships, um, your family relationships, etc. And of course, it's quite hard. One of the things that goes when you're depressed is your motivation to do anything. And then you get stuck in a vicious cycle where you feel ghastly, you don't want to do anything, you have too much time for things to go spinning around your head, and therefore you're even less inclined to do something. So I think, you know, exercise or activity is is one of those areas where body and mind are particularly closely related. I think just to add to that is that so as I said before physical activity is a whole range of activities and it's not just sport or organized activities and there are co-benefits of lots of physical activity happens outside and we know that being outside and being in green and blue space um, so being in like forests and being near the sea and the ocean actually is really beneficial for people's mental health anyway and physical activity usually comes with a social component and I don't we don't understand enough about mo- much of physical activity research is in interested in the physical um, uh, changes that happen in your body when you are physically active. But many of these cold benefits, I think, are critically important for mental well-being. I totally agree. And, you know, we are social animals. So I think one of the things that has been hard and perhaps particularly hard for those in their teens, which is a time when your peer relationships take on particular importance and it's you know about your identity formation as you kind of work out who you are in in your peer group that perhaps is a particularly hard time to suddenly have your social life cut off and where actually social media the active kind of keeping in touch and being able to carry on with some communication with your friends may have been an important mitigation this is probably the perfect segue here, Paul. Um, we've just been talking about physical activity, screen time and mental stimulation. It would be great to hear about your work with Ninja Theory on the game Hellblade, um, which was a huge success selling over a million copies. It would be great to hear a little bit about how mental health was um, such a crucial part of the game. Well, I, I mean, just just raise a hand if I go on too much about this because I'm very enthusiastic about it and I'm I'm very glad that we've heard from Esther beforehand because I I think it's important that we don't get too enthusiastic about video games because of course they're just one aspect of how we how we spend our leisure time and and there are people who have problem gaming who are unhealthy as a consequence both physically and mentally and I think that's important to have that in the in the conversation so Hellblade was a was a game. I mean, it didn't stand first and foremost as a as a representation of mental illness, but it was a game in which the lead character, who's a an eighth century Pictish warrior, um, 
suffered from psychotic experiences, by which we mean she, her reality was different from those around her. So she saw things and heard things that weren't actually there. And so I, I was contacted by a video game studio when they were starting to make this. And, and my initial thoughts were both enthusiastic, but also slightly uh, dubious. Enthusiastic because I think video games are extraordinarily um, interesting instances in which you are very participatory, in which you, you, you sort of take the, the part of a protagonist and you make decisions, you, you advance through the game, you learn things in a way that's, that's very active, um, but also dubious because, of course, video games representation of, of mental illness has not been entirely um, respectful or or acceptable, really. And, and, you know, I think somebody did a study in 2016 or so in which they uh, looked at how, how mental illness had been represented uh, across a host of, of best-selling games up to that point. And the key words that came out were things like psychotic and murderer and psychopathic and, and crazy. Uh, you know, they, they, it was just a sort of trope to motivate the villains in the games, really. But, but I went along to the studio and I met them and it was very clear that they were doing it in a very honest and respectful way. And they immediately wanted to get people with actual experience of mental illness uh, in the discussion. So we had lots and lots of discussions about how it could be represented in a game, what might be the sorts of things that um, that, would, that would work uh, as, as a way of um, helping the user to understand what it might be like to go through this this quest, while at the same time suffering from horrible auditory hallucinations and not being quite sure what's real and what's not, and being overcome with the darkness. So, so it, it was first and foremost a game, but it happened to represent mental illness. And, and I think what came out of that for me was a number of really important lessons about what happens when you, when you take your, your field and you, and you put it into a completely different domain a much more sort of um, unusual domain for me. How about you, what about the audiences? What did you get from the feedback from audiences that you wouldn't have normally, you know, spoken to or had the opportunity to interact with? Yeah, I mean, that for me was the, the most amazing experience of all. But actually, on the day it was released, there was this very interesting phenomenon where it started to sort of catch fire on the internet and people started discussing it. And they were discussing it and mental illness in a very, very sort of respectful way. It was very much um, saying, oh, could this be what it's like? I knew somebody who, who heard voices. Would it have been like this for them? It was a, it was a real sort of empathic um, thing. And also, you know, if I, if I write a paper on hallucination, if I'm lucky, maybe 20 people will read it, including my mother. Um, but this this game sold 1.5 million upwards of 1.5 million copies. So we know that it's reaching a huge audience. Um, and then we were getting lots and lots of testimonials from people who'd who played it and who were deeply touched by by what it meant to them. And and some people were saying, well, you know, I, I've had I've heard voices, and I can now show this game to my friends and say, look, this is this is what it feels like. And and so for me, in terms of impact, it, it just felt so. So gratifying and, and touching just to see what people were making of it. I think for psychosis, that's particularly important because it's a much less usual experience. Um, I mean, there are a number of people, if you ask um, people just in a population, there are a number of people who do hear voices who aren't bothered by it at all and if it's not getting in the way of what you need to do in life then I don't think we should be calling it a problem um, but true psychosis is a very unusual experience whereas you know we've all got anxious about things we've all felt sad about things now that's not the same as an anxiety disorder or a depressive disorder but I think it's much more within the bounds of imagination and mental health or poor mental health is still very stigmatized so the fact that this game accessed loads of people and sparked a debate that was empathetic to the people who are suffering from this condition who are often highly stigmatized and 
you know, there there is a, a reduction in life exp- expectancy of 15 to 20 years amongst those with severe mental illness. So it's, you know, they are a very, very vulnerable group. And I think, you know, it's just fantastic that this game got out there and reached so many people and helped people understand what might be going on for people who experience um, this condition. Okay, let's pause again for a second. We need to catch up with the various layers being added to this conversation. Like one of those layer by layer pancake cakes they made on Bake Off. A conversational schicht torte if there ever was one. Yes, please. We've not only got mental health, but now also physical activity and sedentary behavior and how all of this interacts. Sedentary behavior being lots of sitting. Look up sedentary in the dictionary and there's a picture of me. Me sitting. We know, for example, that even in pre-pandemic times, 80% of adolescents aged between 11 and 18 were not sufficiently active. Which means they weren't getting at least 60 minutes of vigorous activity per day. Not only is this a big number, 80%, but it hasn't changed much in the last 20 years. Instead, children apparently spend quite a lot of their time being sedentary. Very much hoping this isn't because of the terrible example I'm setting. Is it because they're spending more time looking at screens than 20 years ago? Well, children's screen-based activity has definitely increased over that time. But the fact that the activity levels have stayed pretty constant over the same period means that screens can't have led to any decrease in activity levels. Instead, they've probably just displaced other forms of already sedentary activities, such as reading books and playing musical instruments. Although if you've ever seen anyone play something like a bagpipe or a tuba, it sure looks like there's some pretty vigorous activity going on there to me. Or the drums, especially if you're channeling Animal from the Muppets. But from a mental health perspective, the important thing is not whether or not an activity is active or sedentary, but whether it's mentally active or passive. So you might be using a screen, but that's not necessarily an issue when it comes to mental health if you're really absorbed in the content and are actively engaging with it. Think about the difference between how you might read a good book compared to how you might half watch a meh TV show. Apparently, it's the mentally passive activities which are most detrimental to good mental health and well-being. Ooh, so is that a thumbs up to video games? Well... Depending on how you play and the game itself, a video game could be very mentally active rather than passive activity. And how does all of this active or passive activity interact with food? Do our eating habits change during different activities? Sorry, getting a bit sidetracked here, but Paul did ask the question. Well, on the one hand, it's very clear that our eating habits do change during different activities. You don't see Serena Williams munching away on a sandwich during a game of tennis. Or Paula Radcliffe chomping away on a lobster thermidor during a marathon. The problem is that we don't have good data on this on what and how people eat whilst they're doing other things. We only have some activity data, for example from pedometers, and food diaries, basically a record of what they ate that day. And as Nick so kindly offered, pedometer data could be unreliable if there's any chance your subject might have strapped it to their cat. Not to bring the P word back into this again. Pedometers. But has any of this changed since the pandemic? Are people more or less active? Well, we heard there's been a drop in activity, basically a reduction in the number of people getting their 60 minutes of vigorous exercise each day. For children, this is probably because of schools closures and even when they were open, various restrictions which stopped them putting on the usual program of activities. So children have gained weight and lost some of their physical fitness. If I'm anything to go by, these children will have tripled in weight, can no longer fit into any of their pre-pandemic clothes, and are barely able to haul their immense bulk out of bed each morning, they're so unfit. But maybe that's just me. Nope, it's me too. And unfortunately, sorry guys, data shows that this fitness is harder to get back once it's been lost, which has a knock-on effect for later in life. So apart from thinking about children's levels of physical activity, are there any interventions we could use to help improve children's mental health? Well, one intervention that was mentioned was behavioral activation. This is a form of cognitive behavioral therapy used to treat depression. The idea is to increase your contact with positively rewarding activities. Which for me might be spending time with friends. And for me, you might be spending time with friends. 
the sitcom. So if you notice yourself feeling anxious or depressed, then you'd turn to this positively rewarding activity, teaching you that your behaviour can affect and improve your mood. Interventions like these are particularly important for helping with depression in adolescence because one of the things you can lose when you become depressed is the motivation to do anything. Basically, the key point is that we are social animals and that both the body and the mind are closely activated during any activity. And presumably that's why social media isn't necessarily all bad? Exactly. The active part of social media keeping in touch and interacting with friends and family has been really important in helping adolescents during the pandemic, much more so than mindless passive scrolling through feeds. Which is a near perfect description of my use of social media. The latest thing which the algorithm has decided to feed me, lengthy videos about cow hoof repair. That and snippets from It's Me or the Dog. Given all the chat about screen time and computer games, I love that Paul got involved in game development. Oh yeah, you can really see his argument. How many people might read one of his academic papers about mental health versus how many might play a game which includes an accurate and informative representation of mental ill health? Well, we know the answer to that second point. At least 1.5 million copies of Hellblade have been sold, whereas Paul tells us that the readership for his papers is approximately one, his mum. I think he was joking. Paul argued that the benefits of working with game developers is that the ultimate product can share an accurate depiction with a large audience of what it might be like to live with a particular mental illness. A depiction with which players could, for example, share with their friends to help them better understand what they might be going through. Which is particularly good news, given that mental health hasn't always been represented sensitively by video game developers in the past. Yeah, that was a shame to hear. And as our guest reminded us, the stakes are high. Sadly, people who suffer from severe mental illness live on average 15 to 20 years less than they otherwise would. So anything we can do to remove the stigma associated with suffering from and seeking treatment for mental ill health can make a real difference. Both both for Tamsin and Esther, I'm curious whether or not you know of how young people talk to one another about their their own health and one another's health. So is there any data or evidence about the ways that adolescents and young people use or any of the, the media they use to talk to one another about their mental or physical health? That's a really good question. Um, I don't know of much research in relation to that. Um, Many years ago, Graham Thornacroft, who is now an emeritus professor from King's College London, he, with Vanessa Pinfold, who heads up the McPin um, Engagement and Involvement um, organisation, they were doing some work in schools and they got um, the youngsters they were working with just as a warm-up exercise to use all the terms that they knew of for mental health there were none that were offered that were positive. They were all pejorative and they were all the kind of terms that Paul was listing earlier. But, you know, this this would have been 20 years ago. Um, as I say, I don't know any research, but anecdotally, I think we see two things going on. There are horrendous issues with bullying um, and cyberbullying, which is particularly insidious because you can't get away from it. You know, we all have our phones next to each other all the time. If you're bullied at school, at least you go home and at least there are holidays. Whereas if it's online, everyone can see it instantly and it follows you wherever you are. But equally, I think there is more attention in schools to mental health and it gives children a language Um, And I think there are some peer groups where they are, you know, my own daughters who are now in their late teens. um, I was very struck by their wisdom, actually, and the way they supported each other through school. So I think we probably see both um, extremes. And I think we do need some research into this. I think the anti-stigma campaigns have had an effect. You know, there there was... um, the Time to Change campaign, which the Royal College of Psychiatrists was very involved with. And I think, you know, that worked hard to shift views. And it has to a certain extent, um, but I think we've still got more work to do. 
Yeah, I, I would agree. I think, so I wouldn't be able to comment much on how mental health is discussed around um, uh, children and young people, but know a bit more about physical activity and dietary behaviour. And I know as part of the school curriculum, actually, it is part of the national curriculum. So there are discussions around healthy eating and physical activity. However, I do think that in many cases, they are just tick box exercises. They are the, the, the teachers actually offer them and offer them sort of in quite a um, black and white manner. Like you have to eat healthily and you have to be physically active and otherwise you become fat. That's the perception I've sometimes had from when my children have come home. And interestingly, I was I saw the results of some um, public involvement work for one of the studies that I'm involved in recently, where actually the other lesson says, we don't want to hear about physical activity anymore because we have, we've heard so much about it. Um, and so I think there is a bit of a risk that by putting so much emphasis on those discussions, we're actually alienating them from what is actually important. And I think one of the things I always come back to is, in, so the, I work in sort of physical activity research. In our field, it's very much about physical activity is important for your later risk of diabetes or cardiovascular disease or mortality. When you're 14, that's not really what you're concerned about. And so as public health professionals, we might develop these amazing interventions and then try and target the adolescents with talk about their risk of diabetes in 40 years time. But actually, we need to make sure that and, and that's, I think, what some of the national curriculum materials relate to as well. They talk about, um, maybe they talk about obesity, but actually most children don't see that that much as a problem and their parents might not see that as a problem. But then they refer to diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Actually, we need to be a lot better at targeting these interventions at the things that matter to the adolescents themselves. And I think mental health is really important. Doing well at school, having friends, being happy with your social life, those sorts of things are what matters to, uh, to children and adolescents. Or can I just ask maybe to, to finish off this little bit, has your experience with video games and with Hellblade inspired you in any way to think about other slightly unconventional ways of reaching out to children or adolescents or young people um, about the experiences of mental ill health? It has, yeah. I mean, firstly, I, th I think it, it's been intoxicating for me to be involved in a medium that so many people are interested in and care about. So, you know, it's just totally unusual for sort of slightly dusty old academic to have, be doing something that even their own children are quite interested in. You know? <laughs> Um, and I think that's really important. You know, I, I think, you know, you have to go out and meet people on, on, a, on a ground that's of mutual interest. So um, I've actually consolidated my relationship with the video game company and we are working on a number of projects under an overall umbrella, which is going beyond representing mental experience and actually uh, trying to see whether video game design and VR technology can actually help people to change their, their experiences by reframing it, um, altering the ways in which they perhaps, um, you know, experience their own bodily signals. There are all sorts of things you can do that bring, I mean, I suppose, to, to change tack slightly, what video game designers are absolutely brilliant at doing is creating a world that somebody becomes in, immersed and invested in. And actually, that has enormously powerful um, possibilities for good. Obviously, it has possibilities for bad as well. But I think what we're trying to do is harness the, the positive potential benefits. So, yeah, I mean, it's really inspired me. And we're, we're working, um, we're in quite regular um, meetings and discussions, developing a series of projects. I, I think it's really interesting to hear your experience. I, in my field of research, we tend to sort of go the researcher route of developing an intervention and then trying to deliver it and evaluate it. Um, but we cannot compete with these gaming industries. 
And so everything we do looks very um, amateuristic, even if we do um, develop um, collaborations with, I don't know, app developers or gaming developers, we don't tend to have the amount of money that's actually required to develop something that is really engaging and really sort of does what you are talking about. And so I think actually the reverse is actually a really effective strategy to really capitalise on the potential of some of these mediums. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I, I, I've often thought that I, as a in designing cognitive tasks to engage people's language or memory or learning, what I've been trying to do the whole time is develop small games that they will then play and I will be able to assess how well they play them. But, of course, they're such bad games because... <laughs> They're boring, you know, you have to pay people to play them. Whereas you go into a video game design studio and they're, they're working with the same raw material. They're challenging people's cognition, they're setting puzzles, they're getting them to learn and update. But they do it so brilliantly um, and they do it with such sort of extraordinary panache. So I, I feel incredibly fortunate that um, the studio I'm working with, Ninja Theory in Cambridge, actually want to uh, use their skills to do some something scientifically based um, and potentially beneficial. It's extraordinary uh, privilege. Sorry, and, and a huge potential because you can create a world in which people are not only immersed, but they feel safe. So, you know, you can start to help people deal with anxieties, for example, if there are particular situations. Say, for example, you have a teenager who's withdrawing because they find going into school or going to a social event so challenging, you can you could potentially break that down into a number of steps in a game um, and very gradually expose them um, to what they fear and give them a sense of mastery in a way that is perhaps easier and more fun um, than, you know, actually making them work through a, a hierarchy like that in reality. And also, I mean, get, getting back to um, points that Esther's made, you know, the new VR technology is offering some very interesting ways of actually being physically active. Um, there are certain games that you can get with the Oculus Quest that, you know, they'll, they'll raise your pulse 80 or, you know, 20 or 30 beats a minute. Uh, and you're physically very, mostly with arms, but I, I'm sure there are other op opportunities for the future where people will engage in an enjoyable physical activity that's actually a game rather than a, a sort of chore. I think that that's a really interesting area in physical activity promotion. We have tried to look into that, but we also discovered quite quickly that things like a Wii Fit, for example, um, actually people figure out very quickly how to do that, expending the least amount yeah. of energy possible. Yeah, yeah I, th I think that's a great point because naturally our, you know, our, our brains are so well geared to doing things with the least possible effort. Yes. That you're, you are always fighting against that natural tendency. And children and adolescents are the best of that. We yeah. might be able to tell us, oh, no, 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 I need to like keep going because it's good for my physical activity and my health. But children and adolescents will figure it out within a couple of days. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was reminded by a, a school friend who said um, her kids had pedometers when they were at primary school and they very quickly worked out that if they sat on a chair and kicked their legs about... <laughs> They could do the number of steps without moving. And it hadn't even occurred to me that, you know, that kids would do that. Or they put it on the cat or something at home. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm just going to jump it back in and go back to sort of what Esther was highlighting earlier about the, the link between physical and mental health and thinking about the spaces. And I don't know if this is a sort of way of rounding it up, but Tamsin working on the, the Cambridge Hospital, because we haven't really talked so much mm. about treatment side of it. And it sort of almost feels like a perfect fit, the idea of like thinking about the mental and the physical health. Yes, well, it's a really, really exciting um, option. So the for those who um, may not have heard of this endeavour, we are campaigning to build um, a new children's hospital. The east of England is the only region which doesn't have a dedicated children's hospital. And it's a partnership between um, Cambridge University hospitals, so Addenbrooke's primarily, 
and also um, Cambridgeshire and Peterborough NHS Trust, which is a mental health trust, and the university. And the idea is that it, it will be, to use the jargon, a whole new way. So it'll be integrated physical and healthcare. So it'll just be healthcare. Um, but also there will be a research institute on site. Um, so, you know, we'll be working very hard to keep children out of hospital because we know that children recover faster and better when they're at home. But there will always be some children who do need to come into hospital, however briefly, for their treatment. The wards will be split by age. So there'll be a floor for um, teenagers um, and there'll be a floor for children. And at one end of the spectrum, they will be particularly geared to high risk physical health problems. And at the other end of the spectrum, you know, the very severely um, psychologically distressed children. But actually, in, there will be space that could flex either way, depending on who happens to need to be in hospital. The idea is that there'll be joint training, upskilling of staff who come from a mental health or physical health background. Um, and, you know, the co-location is really important, but I think we're aiming to go a step further than that, which I'm not sure that there are many places, if any, in the world where there is such an integration. And the idea is that it will be seamless, both mental and physical health within the hospital, hospital and community. Um, and also research feeding into service evaluation and quality improvement. Brilliant. I, I just to concur with what Tamsin suggests. I think this is so inspiring to be working hard at putting everything onto this into the same space, um, and it, you know it's acknowledging the importance of uh, physical effects on mental health and mental effects on physical health as well. And so, for example, where we, the situation we're in at the moment, we have superb services for young people with eating disorders. Not every area has its own inpatient unit. We have a really good inpatient unit and we can take young people from quite a distance if they need to come because there's not a local bed. But should somebody be so unwell that their blood chemistry is deranged and their physical health is at risk at the moment, they have to be put in an ambulance and sent to the physical health wards in Anderbrooks, three miles away, and their psychological treatment stops, probably at the point they need it most, which is going to slow down their recovery. Whereas if they could have both treatments seamlessly together at the same place with you know the ability to very um, closely um, monitor physical health. You know, eating disorders are the mental health condition with the highest mortality. And they're, you know, people do recover from them, but actually the um, mortality rate is frightening. And, you know, by the point people need to be in hospital, they are really, really pretty unwell. And they do need that close physical health monitoring, but also the intense um, psychological support that an inpatient admission can offer. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a great point uh, and a good illustration of just the importance of this. You know, if, if on the on the wards in Addenbrooke, there may be two or three people in total who are young people with an eating disorder who've had to be transferred because maybe their potassium goes right down, which is very, very dangerous. But then they're just uprooted from the service that they really need psychologically and uh, they may be lying in a bed between somebody who's had a uh, you know who's got severe chest infection and somebody else who's got severe diabetes and they're just they're just totally out of place there and although the the psychiatry service within Addenbrooke and also the eating disorder service do try to to keep up the input it's it's impossible to do it when they're at, when they're uh, on a general ward like that it's not the same as having a dedicated team no, of skilled no. professionals around you 24 7. Yeah. Esther, are you ever in the position of thinking about what treatment might look like for either mental or physical ill health or poor diets, for example? Or are you most concerned about preventative measures which avoid getting young people to the point where they need to access something like 
you know, this shared mental and physical whole health space that Tamsin's talking about? Yeah, so my research is very much rooted in public health. And so I am um, mostly concerned, well, actually only concerned um, with, uh, that may not be the correct phrase, um, but I I think about prevention of um, physical and mental ill health. Um, so that might be, I don't know, diabetes or obesity or mental health disorders. Um, so actually, I, I do not engage actively with research that is about treatment. Um, so even when I think about things like um, childhood obesity, um, all of my work is around preventing childhood obesity and doesn't necessarily focus on when children are obese, what what do we do to help them on the correct trajectory again to grow into a normal weight? And do you feel that um, some of these issues you're talking about, so physical activity, for example, the diet that children and young people um, might be enjoying, in inverted commas, is this sufficiently high up the public health agenda from your perspective? So yes and no. Um, There's a lot of attention for childhood obesity. Um, Now, in terms of childhood obesity, that if we if you look at the childhood obesity plan for from the government, that focuses predominantly on eating behaviours and it's predominantly on primary school children. And so there's this whole group of secondary age children or adolescents that is not completely ignored, but largely ignored. I think they are very much perceived as almost like a a lost, not a lost generation, but a lost period, because actually you can't do much with them. They do what they want anyway. Um, And then in terms of physical activity, I think that is largely ignored Partly because actually we don't have very strong evidence for its relationship with childhood obesity. Um, But I also think because it's quite difficult to change and the, the, the strategies the government wants to take are not the ones that work best for physical activity. But I think it's usually important to focus on physical activity because it has such a wide range of benefits. Um, and it may not be directly the most important thing for childhood obesity, but it definitely contributes to it. But it has many other benefits, including social and mental well-being benefits and benefits beyond obesity that are or physical health. So, for example, some we know in children, some of the blood markers for, um, for example, precursors of um, type 2 diabetes, actually they are affected by children's physical activity levels. So, uh no, I don't think it's high enough on the agenda, and we're working very hard to um, to provide the evidence that will actually increase the uh, uh, the importance of it. One caveat I need to put with that, and we don't know what impact we've this has had, but one of the things that really struck me during the pandemic, throughout the pandemic, one of the only reasons you were allowed to go out was to be physically active. So this has really put physical activity at this. So this was like it was up there with going to work. If you couldn't work from home, actually getting shopping, that physical activity was sort of elevated in status. How that has impacted the population view of physical activity and how important it is we don't know we're we're starting some research around that but uh, so i think it it will change over the next few years because you could almost sort of say that it might have had more of an impact than say like a national or sporting event or something like that in terms of engaging the public in physical activity yes and also lots of people actually took that opportunity and went out as a family and went out on family walks and actually there's lots of anecdotal evidence that people have really enjoyed that now we don't know how that anecdotal evidence will actually translate into population physical activity levels and whether that will maintain um but i think it it it's it was really interesting to observe that happen. Do you think, so in the context of the conversation we've just had, do you think people perceive that hour of physical activity as being beneficial only to their physical health? Or did they see that as something which was also helping them cope with the mental strains and difficulties um, of lockdown? 
So I, I think both. I think that's a very good question. I think many people... I think people obviously responded differently to the situation of the lockdown, but I think many people did see the opportunity to go outside, be outside, get some fresh air, see some greenery, actually was helping them cope with the situation of the lockdown. Um, and so although there will have been a group of people that will have particularly used it to improve or maintain their physical health, I think for a lot of people who may not have been as active before, actually it was a way of coping with the the mundaneness of lockdown. I wonder to what extent as well it uh, illustrates the old adage that, it, you know, if you want to increase the extent to which people value something, you just limit their access to it a bit. Um, and the idea, you know, it's sort of like... Um, uh, exercise time in a prison, I imagine, where you just think, this is my time, finally I can do this. Okay, so I guess we've reached the end of the conversation. I noticed the guests had more to say about the stigma surrounding mental ill health. Absolutely. In particular, we heard that we really need more research into bullying and cyberbullying. Again, I hope they're not expecting me to do it. Anecdotally, we know that cyberbullying is especially insidious, as there's no escape. It's instantaneous and there on your phone, which you probably have with you 24-7. And as well as hearing about the need for campaigns which try to reduce stigma around mental ill health, we also heard about the need for a more nuanced understanding of the risks. We also heard that although we know there is a link between people's physical activity earlier in life and, for example, the risks that they might suffer from diabetes later in life, highlighting this to adolescents isn't a great way to get them to change their behaviour. Yeah, it turns out that adolescents aren't really thinking much about whether or not they might suffer from diabetes 40 years in the future. Who'd have thought? When I was a teenager, I was worried about what might happen 40 years in the future, but less about diabetes and more about whether or not I'd turn into the teacher from the Browning version. And what's all this about a new Cambridge Children's Hospital? Oh yeah, that sounds both exciting and worthwhile. Like a birthday party at COP26, or doing the vacuuming with a new Dyson, assuming you're over 30. The idea of the Cambridge Children's Hospital is that wards will be split by age, but not by mental and physical ill health. Instead, physical and mental health care will be integrated with the effects of physical health on mental health and mental health on physical health being considered at the same time, in the same place. Tamsin described this as treating the whole child. Which makes me think of Cheerios. This new hospital configuration would help, for example, the treatment of eating disorders, as otherwise, in more traditional medical settings, the physical treatment might mean that the psychological treatment gets put on hold which is crucially important to avoid as eating disorders are some of the mental health disorders with the highest mortality rates. And by the time that people are in hospital, they are often already really ill. Well, that concludes another episode of Mind Over Chatter. Stay tuned for our next episode on dementia. Before then, please spread the Mind Over Chatter word. Who do you know whose life is simply incomplete without our voices in their ears? And please fill out our survey to tell us what you think of the podcast. You can find the link to the survey in the episode description. We want it all, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Oh, and please make sure to leave us a review on whatever platform you use to listen to your podcasts. We like reviews. Hopefully a good one. Not a bad or an ugly one. A huge thanks once again to our guests, Paul Fletcher, Tamsin Ford, and Esther Van Sluis. And finally, a big thank you to the sickeningly talented Carlo Ladd for our music and to the equally talented Alex Sadler for our artwork. See, See you, you next, next time. time.